Yes. Wow. Hey, regarding your acting career, when did you develop the passion for acting and the art of performing? You know, it's okay. Uh, well, are we starting for real now? Yes. I was, yes, I was we just are. flap. Okay. Forget everything I said up to this point. <laughs> we are now at the start point. So yeah. ask a question. Go ahead. Okay. When did you develop the passion for acting? You know, the art of performing, like in the fine arts, like acting, doing a probably, lot of probably, probably in utero. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> probably in utero um it was part of who i was interestingly i was i was a very shy child okay wow. i was an introverted child um but i was a an only child raised around a bunch of adults so i didn't get kids i didn't know how to deal with them <laughs> so uh i i was a sort of introverted but i was constantly going to you know the usual things dance classes this that what have you and um it just felt like that's where I belonged, mm -hmm. particularly in live performance. Because wow. uh, at that point, we, we, we really didn't have anything to do with TV or film or anything like that. It right. had to do with get up on stage. And I know I, I'd just been off stage for a, quite a number of years and I just did a show recently. It, it, it just felt so good. I had to walk right down center and look at the audience. It was empty, but look at the theater and go home. I'm home. <laughs> so even though, yeah, you do uh, theater and you do film and you do TV and we, we'll get into the stunt work and the voice work and all this nonsense. I still believe that an actor's true home is always theater. Now, there are those who will disagree with me. Yeah. Oh. Quite a few, in fact. But uh, I, I think that's where you should come from. And that's my little bit of advice for anybody who wants to become an actor, a voice actor, or any other kind of media actor. First, be an actor, get your silly fundament up on stage and start feeling the connection with a live audience. Because once you get into media or voice work, you're not going to have that. No, you're not. Yeah. And so, and it's, you know, it's get, get you that feeling first. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I also. I consider myself an introvert and you know I have a martial arts background and that helped me come <laughs> out of my shell a lot and I want to say I'm not sure you're a you're a martial artist too right well sort of I've messed okay. with Aikido Taekwondo and whatnot but mostly I'm a theatrical sword fighter okay because I remember um you shared this picture on your public Facebook page that you used to be a cheerleader too and you know <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, you see, nobody makes it this far into the business without having had a rather checkered career. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, for you soccer fans out there, yes, I belonged to the first squad of soccer, professional soccer cheerleaders for the New York Cosmos. And boy, amazing. from that to voice acting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's amazing. I, if you don't understand live audiences, running out in a little yellow getup, waving pom-poms at the Meadowlands in front of a crowd of three or four million people is going to hit you pretty hard, you know, but we, you got to love it. You've got to love it. You've got yeah. to walk out there and go, me, this is all about me. Look at how cool I am, you know, <laughs> even, <laughs> even if you don't believe it, you got to talk yourself into it or you won't go out there. I love it when they say that public speaking is the most terrifying thing that people can face. Yeah. Because I never understood why. I think it's great. I think it's fun. But yeah. that's I, the I actor like, thing. Yeah, I have a mixed feeling with that. The public speaking kind of is a little terrifying for me personally, but on the, on the flip side, it helps me come out more of my show again because, you know, I'm sharing what I'm putting out there with a lot of people and if they find it interesting. It makes me put a great smile on my face, you know? Sure. I'm but like, you're I'm, doing, doing, I'm, I'm doing, you're doing something it right. A, in a podcasty kind of way. Now, yeah. if you go ahead and take that and take it to like a, a panel at a convention or something like right. that, now you're just tell yourself you're doing the same thing. Yeah. You can just see the audience. And that's why I think you should do theater because you got to get accustomed to seeing the audience and knowing that they're there and also feeling the, uh, the circuit close. Yeah. You don't have that in voice acting. You don't have that in TV or film, generally speaking. 
except when you're doing situation comedies. And that's another thing we could get into. I, <laughs> my first guest star credit was in uh, The Jeffersons. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I and just, I saw you. Incredible. I saw you on there. You did? Yes. The Gladys Knight episode. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. Uh -huh. I, I was so shocked because I seen like a couple actors that I know for doing voice work on old shows back in the 80s. It, it blew my mind so much to see you guys performing on stage or any kind of acting medium. It's so amazing. Oh, it's, it's a whole different world. It, it's it's yeah. wonderful fun. And, and the thing about doing a situation comedy, uh, what they call three camera, <laughs> is that it it splits the difference you have the three cameras you've got to be camera aware you've got to know the blocking you've got to know how to handle it and you have a live audience Oof. talk about so, pressure <laughs> oh yeah i remember auditioning for that i was still a young actor in la and uh i went in i auditioned for it it was a, kind of a snooty role you know she was kind of <laughs> yeah. a snob and uh, i did it and remember they looked at me and said have you ever done three camera sitcom before and I, I said, uh oh, I'm dead. Whenever they <laughs> ask you a question like that, you're not going to get the role. And I looked at them and I said, well, actually, no, I haven't. And they smiled and looked at each other and said, well, maybe we can fix that. That's wow. what you want to hear. That's what you want to hear. Next thing I know, I'm there on stage with, you know, Marla Gibbs and, and we got, um, you know, Gladys Knight, who was a riot. Oh, she was so much fun with that yeah. green mask on her face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was fantastic. And that is where a young actor gets an enormous boost from a more experienced actor. Because, you know, I had those scenes with Marla Gibbs. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. A, the woman's brilliant. Yes. And, yes she, uh, is. she knew that it was my first three camera gig. She knew it. We talked yeah. about it. And I was doing a scene with her. They were shooting it and you couldn't, they couldn't see her. her. Her back was to the camera. She smiled at me and she just shifted her weight from one leg to the other. And she was looking dead in my eyes and smiling when she did it. And she could see the thank you in my eyes because she knew that I had just missed the mark slightly and I was being blocked from the camera. And she shifted her weight away to clear me for camera. Now, that's not only a more experienced actor helping the newbie. That's a gracious lady saying, you know, no, honey, this is how it's done. Let me help you. I'll never forget that. I will never forget that. That, that is the sort of thing that you take to your grave. Because somebody had the graciousness to teach you on the job training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and to help you get a good shot i mean and and it's live you know this stuff mm -hmm. is going on this is not like take two take three they do that as well but you're in front of a live audience so she didn't yell cut or anything you know she couldn't anyway it wasn't the director but she just took care of it and taught me something absolutely mind-bendingly useful for the rest of my career Thank I love you. That lady. Thank you so much for sharing that because I'm a fan of Marla Gibbs from the Jefferson. I've been seeing her in other films like The Meteor Man. I've seen mm -hmm. that woman's been amazing. And just recently, I just found out she finally got her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I was like, Did she? Yes, she did. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, it, nobody deserves it more. That is a yeah. classy, classy lady and mm -hmm. very funny. Yeah. <laughs> very funny. I mean, the trick is to keep a straight face. One of my favorite clips from my whole career was when I shoved her face into that steamer. <laughs> you know, I put my... Here. And Aww. what I did for that, and there's something, there's a little story. Oh, God, we're never going to get off the Jeffersons. Um, no, you're fine. Do you remember the original Dracula with Bela Lugosi? Yes, yes, yes. Ooh, man. Okay, when he comes out of the coffin, you see his hands with the knuckles kind of bent around and they're very weird. He looks, he looks like a vamp vampire just with his hand. Mm -hmm. Watch that clip with me parsh pushing her face into the, um, the oh, steamer. Oh my God. Because I was doing a Bella Lugosi hand, deliberately raised it far over her head and then pushed her down into the steamer. But I stole that from... Bela Lugosi's Dracula. Man, what? That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that again. Yeah, wow. 
I told you oh. I had good good stories, and we haven't even got to the things you want to talk about. We, oh we no, we're fine. You you just share me. <laughs> you just you just share me. You just make you just making this interview more more progressively. It's such a privilege hearing the hearing these stories because you never know. It's never been documented, and I'm glad I'm doing it right now. Thank you so much, Melody. <laughs> the My stories God. behind the stories. You can go back and watch that episode again. Yeah, it. definitely. Do you will. know I still get the occasional residual for that? Oh, like, did you? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Two or three cents. Okay. I mean, it, 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 the, the, <laughs> the episode is older than dirt. Yeah, but, yeah. So it's a little tiny thing, but it just reminds me every now and again that nothing dies in syndication. Right, right, right. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of, yeah, speaking of on-camera acting, you did it. Um, um, I tried so hard not to laugh because I know my friend Chris Mayak, excuse me if I'm pronouncing his last name wrong, he interviewed you um, several months back. Yes. We were talking about the movie Spellbinder. Oh, I wow. showed them a clip of you doing your martial arts stunt work. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. You you were you were not playing no games, Melody, in that role. No, I was not. <laughs> oh my gosh. Kicking and I see some you booty. do like a like a sidekick to his head. And I'm like, my gosh. Yes. And, yes. Uh that was when I and also that high fall when I go yeah. over the balcony. Mm -hmm. I did that. I did that. That was amazing. Did you? Were you okay? I had to ask this, but were you <laughs> <laughs> no, no, my chimes are still ringing. Now, what happened was actually very beautiful on that. That was being shot in a uh, wonderful old home. It wasn't on a soundstage. Okay. And um, Tim Daly is a, another terrific guy to work mm -hmm. with. I uh, really appreciated him because he had a great respect for us, for the stunt team. Yeah. And when I was running at him because of the height of the balcony, yeah, I had to step on uh, you familiar with what they call an apple box or a half apple box. It's those little tiny boxes that they put on sets to make people taller or shorter or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I stepped on either a half or, a, or an apple box, whichever they had for me. And then I pushed off that and I had to go over the balcony. But we were on a hardwood floor. Oh, so the minute I'm running at him, the minute my foot hit the box, zoop, right out from under me, and I could have clocked my head. I mean, I could have gotten hurt big time because yeah. I also have to control the high fall after that. They had cameras down below waiting for the high fall. Yeah. Well, Tim looked at this and he went, okay, got it. No problem. And as I ran at him, a lot of actors would have just dropped down and left me to my fate. <laughs> he dropped down and wrapped his body around that box and clamped it. So when I pushed off the box, it didn't move. He was helping me again. And there again, it's the Marla Gibbs effect. It's a more <laughs> experienced person, or at least a co-worker, however you want to look at it. Yeah. Helping, seeing that there's an issue and fixing it and he clamped around that box every time I did that high fall um the hard part was actually not the high fall uh although it was a pretty decent high fall I, yeah, have, friends who do hundred, <laughs> I have friends who do hundred footers and I'm <laughs> that puppy but um I did do that fall several times but then they needed the insert shot of me hitting the ground <laughs> and the way we did that is we sent me up a step ladder and they put a very thin pad under the Persian carpet and I had to jump off the step ladder, flip, mm -hmm. go sideways, and hit the ground so that they had the impact shot. I did yeah. that three or four times, and the director just looked at me and said, I can't watch this anymore. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not getting hurt. I'll do it until you have it right. But that was it's essentially that was uh, three shots, me running at him, me doing the high fall, well, and then flip. me hitting the ground. Yeah. And thank goodness for editors. And this is something, again, that you don't have in live theater. If you're doing live theater, you just mm -hmm. have to do it and hope it works. <laughs> yeah, the show, the show must go on. <laughs> the show must go on, no matter what is happening out there. <laughs> yeah, so, I yeah, can... Spellbinder. And um, I've got it out there. You know, one of the things that um, I found out is one of the most popular things that I've done was technically a stunt comedy role, which was in Princess Diaries 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I, when I was like doing my homework on you, I'm like, she was in that movie. Like, oh yeah, I'm like, <laughs> wasn't in the movie. I was put also put in the trailer, which I thought was hysterical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> when uh, when I got hit in the chest and did that, 
and <laughs> fell over and whatever. That was considered funny enough to make it to the trailer. And I was very relieved about that. But the archery is legit. Uh, I'm, I'm a recurve archer. Uh, I don't that that's my my thing. I like I like a short recurve because you can also use it for har horse archery, which I also do a lot of horse work. So, uh, yeah. You can do that. Yeah. If you have never done horse archery, try it sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, it it will get your attention. <laughs> yeah. I'm currently taking karate right now, so I can know how strenuous and exciting that can be every time I take it. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Every time I take karate, I've always having a lot of fun because you're putting yourself out there doing all these type of self-defense techniques and all other things because it's, a, it's an art form. And sure. It's just like how acting it, it encourages you, encourage you to be more creative with yourself and know yourself and what you're capable of, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. And, and in fact, uh, the, the martial arts thing, uh, you're doing karate. I did a little bit of taekwondo, but a mm -hmm. uh, little bit, a little bit. But okay. when I was uh, prepping for Spellbinder, <laughs> I was taking Tai Chi. Yeah. And, I, and Aikido. Ooh. And I have found that uh, Taekwondo and Tai Chi Aikido have prepared me for two different approaches to the challenges of life. In Taekwondo, Karate, or whatever like that, somebody hits you, you block them and you punch their lights out. Yeah. In Aikido, you step aside and keep them going on their own energy. You know, you just, you let them put themselves through the wall. And I find that those two philosophies can get you through life. Sometimes you need Taekwondo, sometimes you need Aikido, and it depends on who you're dealing with and what the situation is, which one you bring to the table. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And uh, that will get you through life. Those two approaches to any situation, one or the other will work. Yeah. And I got to say, Melody, um, I should I should share you share this with you. I'm from Chicago, too. And your Chicago accent is still beautiful as always. I mean, <laughs> I left you, when I was four days old. That shows how good I am. Yeah. Wow. That's a, still amazing. I mean, it's so strong and pronounced. Like I can that this woman got to be from Chicago because. Oh, no, no, I'm not from Chicago. I'm from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, when I was four days old, they took me out of Chicago and raised me in Brooklyn. Okay, yeah. Man. So I've got a little bit of that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, I, can, I can hear it too now. Man, you got, a, you got an amazing background. I got to tell you that. It's, it's amazing like to hear these vet, veteran actors like yourself sharing these amazing stories with your career and how it helps you in the long run, you know? Yeah. Because as, you know, as most people see actors just doing their job, but they do a morning job. They put themselves out there. They put their livelihood out there just you know, make feel most importantly feel good about yourself. <laughs> and well, we're often accused of having uh, major league egos, and gosh, oh, knows, I've, yeah. I've run into a few of those. But if you can't check that good e big ego at the door, you're not going to make it either. Because for every mm -hmm. for every job that you get, you can go through between 100 and 300 and 400 auditions that you don't get. And if you take that personally, you have the life expectancy of a chocolate kettle. You're not going to make it. That. You're going to melt down and die. Mm -hmm. You have got to move on. And some of them hurt more than others. You know, some of them you go, hey, I should have gotten that. Mm -hmm. And others, uh, <laughs> you know, look, it's not your choice. I've done casting yeah. too. And I can tell you from a casting point of view that it doesn't always have anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's a good example for you. I've got ready okay. here. Mm -hmm. If I'm being cast or I'm being considered for a role playing a love scene against a guy who has reddish hair, I will never be cast in that role ever. Mm. Two of anything else is fine, but there are so few redheads that it looks yeah. like it looks um, <clears throat> well, there are all kinds of words for it, but it, it looks like improper. We'll call it that. Wow. It looks like brother sister, you know? Like I said, two of anything else is fine. Yeah. But two redheads will never get cast opposite each other in a love scene. Yeah. Very well. well I won't say never. Okay. There's no such thing as never. Yeah. Never right. It's just nine, really nine, 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 nine. Yeah. It rarely Many happens. Times. Very rare. Very, very rare. And it's a good point you share that because what uh, I'm a big fan of the Harry Potter films, and there's a family called Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. They're red, they're redheads too, gingers. 
Yep. I rarely see them interact romantically. They just play like the mom and dad of so many kids and reduce that rare romantic interaction between the two. It's uh, that's one of the rare times when you see anything like that. But yeah, uh, yeah the implication is that uh, the children were born by virtue of extremely persuasive note leaving or something. Wow. You know? <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> yeah. You're right. It does, it's not a the, the whole redhead to redhead love scene thing. It, yeah. It's for some reason it just blows people away. So if I go in and I read for something and the guy's got reddish hair. I won't get it, even if I'm the best person who walked through the door. Mm hmm. It doesn't matter. So don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> You're always going to take it personally at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially for an actor. You just like, you know, it's like, you know, from what I've been told by many veterans, they say you got to set a lot of notes before you get the yes that you've been searching for when it comes to auditions, because you're you're throwing yourself out there with the, all these auditions you're hoping like you get the part many times you don't get the part and you know you just like, keep trying again try and get till you get a yes from the producers yeah, or the casting directors and you never know why uh mm -hmm. you never know why you don't get a role uh it could be and this is something that actors talk about among themselves all the time it could be that you resemble the producer's ex-husband or wife and oh, boy, yeah. like that person it could be that you sound like somebody they already have on the set mm -hmm. it could be anything and you can get thrown out of a role for weird reasons a friend of mine not going to mention the name mm -hmm. voice performer voice performer uh was cast based on a voice audition okay. got to the set and was told to go home because the person the actor actress had blonde hair and the character that she was, are you ready? Voicing was a brunette. So she wow. couldn't possibly do it. Ah. <laughs> does that wow. make sense? Make no, sense? it does it not. Make sense. No. But does he put a voiceover home. role? No. Yes. yes. It can get that crazy. <laughs> and, yes. uh, you know, you don't know why they're not using you. Sometimes they tell you, sometimes they don't. They might not even know why. You just rub them the wrong way for whatever reason. Right. Or the right way. Yeah, or the right way you know they they might look at you and like you you and you might not be as good as two other people who came in before but they'll use you you never know yeah and speaking of your um brooklyn um uh, background i know yes, that you, what? <laughs> you did some um adr work for the um film aliens resurrection like you double for a uh, sigourney weaver yeah doing her, but that was one of the coolest things that I think yeah. has ever happened to me. Yeah, I'm I, with you. Look, I, I, I'm a fan. I'm a geek. I, 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 I grew up on science fiction. This is all big deal to me. And uh, I was brought in for Alien Resurrection with a bunch of people, and we were going to do looping. Now, if you don't yeah. know, a lot of people don't know the difference between all the different kinds of voice acting, but looping is when you are doing, in, in our case, English to English, it's you're going in and you're sweetening the background sound. Sometimes you're replacing a voice here or there. Very often they'll shoot a scene and there's people in the background in, eating or drinking or walking by and you have to give them dialogue they don't have. So you're improving and creating. And, and it's, it's, it's a very interesting aspect of voice acting. I, I it is. Like it. But in this case, for whatever reason, as I recall, it was the scene where, um, there's the hybrid mm -hmm. of Ripley oh, and yeah. Alien and, and I know you're talking about. I, I had sort of worked on the alien scream, which I can't do anymore, but I did at that point yeah. pretty reasonably well. And um, they had to replace her voice for that and a little bit of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And they had all the women in this group because when you're on a big sound stage, you have a big group of people. So um, maybe four or five or six of us went up there yeah. and tried to voice match her. Mm. And interestingly, she has a pretty good vocal range. She can go quite high, but uh, yeah. in for Ripley, she drops it down into the basement, which is a big thing for me because I have a deeper voice. So I was the one they picked to replace her voice and great. And the greatest thing that ever happened was as we were watching the, the film on this big sound stage um, or ADR stage, they would go, okay, for the next scene, we're going to need, uh, and they'll point to a couple of actors, we're going to need you, 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 and then they pointed to me and said, and uh, Ripley, you're on deck. And I was sitting there like, and they, they, they called me Ripley. Ah! 
I mean, I completely geeked out. I, you can't do it on stage. You're total pro. Right, 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 right. Everything's good. Then I went home and had a complete meltdown. Oh. Professional situation. I actually got called Ripley and who doesn't love something like that that is that's the sort a of greatest thing, compliment again, that you take man. to your grave <laughs> yeah that's a great that's one of the greatest compliments in your career that's that's amazing can you see that on my tombstone yeah yeah but once they called me ripley <laughs> oh man i'm i'm glad i asked you that question that thank you melody that, that's awesome yeah that's awesome it was fun <laughs> yeah speaking of um adr loop um, when Robotech came your way back in the mid eighties, how did you approach that? <laughs> how did you approach that role? Was it ADR looping was a whole nother ball game for you in the acting game? Well, you're not looping when it was in another language and you're taking it into English. Okay. Uh, then you're dubbing. Okay. Dubbing. Mm -hmm. And when Robotech, when, when Carl Masick was bringing some of this early Japanese stuff over, a bunch of us had already been doing different kinds of dubbing. Films would come in from Europe. There's another story there, but I won't get into it. There's, gosh, we could go on for hours. The films would come in from Asia, TV, whatever. All kinds of stuff was coming in. And this Japanese stuff started to come in, mm -hmm. which we had not really seen much of prior to. But it was just another voice job. It was, could have been from Germany, it could have been from Italy, it could have been from Korea, it could have been from Japan. It, it, it was just, it didn't matter. It was not that big a deal. To the point where we were doing Robotech and, and the Captain Harlock stuff and the early stuff and all of this stuff, and we're doing all this strange Japanese stuff and looking at each other and going, okay, this stuff is strange. Um, and about a year after I'd been doing it, I looked at an article that somebody was writing about this stuff and I remember turning to well, other folks and <laughs> saying, can you clarify something for me? What is anim? <laughs> and they went anime. I said, I don't see an accent over the E, it's anim. What is this stuff? They said, well, that's that Japanese stuff we've been doing. I said, it has a name. It has a name. <laughs> well, not only does it have a name, baby, it has legs. And next thing you know, that's what we're known for. We, all of a sudden it's like the the biggest things in sliced bread <laughs> uh, i it was it was like it, 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 it blew us away because we were not prepared for the japanese animation in particular to catch traction but wow did it as we all know subsequently yeah. oh, and yeah. uh by the way all of us who were in at the beginning and who floated along with it all these years are just thrilled that it did. <laughs> oh yeah, we've got yeah. no problem with that. <laughs> yeah, I talked to uh, Michael Suarez. He's still he's still amazed at all these years, man. Oh, uh, Michael Suarez is his own story. Isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I still remember um, sitting on the stairs when we were all a bunch of newbie actors and sitting mm -hmm. on the stairs. I didn't even know him particularly. We had just met. It's two in the morning because at some point we were like literally doing 24 seven dubbing. I mean, it was like, we're sitting on the stairs. We're exhausted. We're sitting there. And he and I started talking about uh, running and doing marathons because both of us were marathoners. Wow. And that's how we bonded was over that. Nice. And the next thing I know, we're working together. And of course, he's the one who brought me into da 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 bo 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 he is the only person i know who could have directed that crazy outfit i mean that Man. was e even for anime that was out there that was an amazing show i love that show so everybody did great everybody was so goofy and hilarious it was so funny you as torpedo guard oh my goodness it was so funny i remember once he like because i'm a torpedo i'm a torpedo <laughs> Yes. And uh, I remember I, I remember Michael Sorich calling me up and saying, yeah, you got to play this. I don't know anybody else who can do this. <laughs> and oh I said, gosh. OK, what am I? He said, you're basically a torpedo with showgirl legs. I said, of course I am. What sound does yellow make? What do you want for this character? And I watched her and oh I went, gosh. oh, my gosh, she's fun. She is so much fun. It's um. 
it has become a kind of weird, even within the anime world, cult yeah. favorite. Not yeah. everybody knows about it, mm -hmm. but I think everybody should because that was a kind of anime that I, it's its own thing. No, nothing else looks like it. Yeah. Nothing else sounds like it. And nothing else has the fist of the nose hair attack. So yeah. <laughs> and you just brought up another talk it, um, with that reference, uh, Fist of the North Star. You play this role, Julia. Now, that's one of my favorite roles because it's you in a, in a romantic role. It's, it's, such a, it's, a, it's such a good good role for you. I'm glad that you you were able to take that role as Julia. I mean. Wow, so am I. And uh, thank you, Carl Masick. It was um, very rare. Because, I mean, listen to me. Am I ever mm -hmm. going to get the romantic lead? No. Right. I'm going to get the bad girl. I'm going to get the weird one. I'm going to get the dragon. I'm going to get all this stuff. But I'm not going to get the romantic ingenue lead. Mm -hmm. He trusted me with Julia. Wow. I mean, that was out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could tell, man. And the yeah. other thing, too, is when we didn't know about that splatter stuff, um, I, I did my recordings and there was some weirdness in there, but it wasn't too bad for Julia. Then I went to see the screening and I, my jaw was on the floor. It's like, wow, this is a mess. Look at all these body parts flying around. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a classic. It is. And I'm really glad to have done it. And I'm so happy that you gave an amazing performance as his character because it's so, how authentic and realistic that role is for you to play is it's amazing melody i'm thank you for portraying that role the best to your abilities you did a great job i really appreciate that because she was not as easy as mm -hmm. some i remember watching an interview with uh was it linda hamilton when she did uh, uh dante's peak and they said uh well you've never done anybody normal and she said what's normal normal isn't hard you know you're just normal and yeah. I remember looking at the interview and saying, no, normal's hard. No, you don't understand. Easy is the big ones, you know, the big dramatic, the ones that are kind of out there. Those are fine. Those, those are easy for me. I can do those asleep. Julia had to be the human anchor. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah, by the way, uh, <laughs> of course, Julia was... Uh, <clears throat> my first anime nude scene, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, that was interesting when I was in the <laughs> studio and I saw that come up. It was like, um, <laughs> the clothes on. I yeah. just, ooh, it was a little creepy. I, the minute I would watch, I'm like, hey, okay, moving on, moving on, moving on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I don't, uh, mm, that's a little weird. But yeah. yeah, sometimes the reality, the real people, the um, the human ones, Mm -hmm. can be the hardest yeah to do because they're the closest to you and as you and i both know as introverts <laughs> it's the closer it is to you personally without the overlay of a large big out character or whatever the closer it is to you without any of that with all that stripped away mm -hmm. the more personal it is and yeah. the more personal it is the more risky it is so Julia was kind of a risky one for me. And the fact that you think I did a good job means a lot. You're very welcome because I enjoy when, I, when an actor shared that they put a lot of themselves into a role like that, especially when it's so, it's so much characterization and humanization in that role. It's, it, it always gets me right here because I can understand and resonate with that character, especially with the cadence in your performance as that role. So thank you again, well, Melody. No, my pleasure. And it's true that as an actor, no actor can play any role that is not partially who they are. You ha it has to come from somewhere. So there has to be this cabinet in the back that you can go and open yeah. different cabinets and, and pull out aspects of yourself. And then you take that aspect of yourself and you open it up, which is uh, one of the reasons why when people come to me um, who want to be voice actors, which I look at them like they're crazy because they are um and i they say oh, i want to be a voice actor i can do voices no. and there are people there are voice actors who take it from that perspective i don't my feeling is i don't 
ever do voices. I don't. I play a character and the character has a voice and they speak through me. It's almost like you're a medium, you know, exactly, channeling exactly. something through yourself. And uh, it, it, it's very much all from your own mind. It's all from your own spirit, especially when you're doing voice acting, because there is no audience. There isn't even another human being there. You are alone in the headphones with your mind, with your heart, with your spirit, pulling it out of your toenails and taking more risks sometimes than others, but it's always something of a risk because whatever you do, you're going to be out there for people to say yay or nay. Again, remember that ego thing? Check Mm -hmm. it at the door. You're going to get people like, okay, Fist of the North Star, give you an idea. We were very careful in those days, not only to start and stop when the character starts and stops because you're matching the mouth movements, but to hit what we call the internals. You know, so there's a, a certain mouth movement to an M or an A or an O or whatever. So we tried to match it as closely as possible to what the characters were doing. But right. when some of the prints were released, they were p- released about a frame off. Ooh. We didn't do that. That happened. It was it was a mistake in post. It, but the actors, we didn't do that. When we did it, it was on, spot on. Yeah. For decades, we were slammed and flamed for it, because we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah, we did, and we did it right. It was a tech thing after the fact. There was no digital editing then. It was all you all had to do it, right there. It had to be done right. Do you remember um, where the term looping comes from? I do not. Back in the day, and I'm talking before me, we're talking back in the days when it was just film and big theaters and all of that nonsense, right? Mm-hmm. If you had to replace something, they literally took the film and looped it. Okay, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The film. And the actor had to keep doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it until it was correct because you couldn't shift it, you couldn't move it, you couldn't compress it, you couldn't stretch it, you couldn't do anything. It had to be correct, Mm -hmm. actually correct at the moment while you were doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first started in voice, it was sort of still like that. I mean, we weren't looping, mostly we weren't doing a loop of a physical loop of film but we couldn't Mm -hmm. do all the digital editing we do now yeah Mm -hmm. so you had to start at the right time you had to stop at the right time you had to hit the internals and it had to happen live you had to get it right they couldn't fix it after the fact not effectively so that's great training though yeah it is it's like when you're learning how to ride a horse the best way to learn how to ride a horse is to get on the horse bareback (laughs) <laughs> yeah oh yeah <laughs> you can balance that you can handle that any saddle is going to be a piece of cake same yeah. thing pro tools and all that well, after pro tools people who came in after that well they just don't know how hard it was <laughs> when we were young uh it was a whole different world yeah and speak, and little speak history of, there <laughs> thank yeah thank you for sharing that and you know i was just thinking about what you said about character voices because people keep forgetting about that you gotta be a character too before you perform the voice yes and speaking of character there's this show called flint the time detective <laughs> it's, it's a saban product you play two characters Artie and eldora yeah those care I, I got actually i got a clip if that if you don't mind playing the character eldora it's a high voice for you it's a, it's a really high voice oh and yeah it, remind it, me please play it all right let me play it right now oh <sighs> I have to say, you have an amazing, <laughs> <laughs> you have an amazing range. <laughs> well, you're really taking me back. I don't remember your name. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, well, that, <laughs> <laughs> remember what I said about reality? Forget it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are times when you just fall back on technique. <laughs> I mean, what's up like that? You know, that's, 
That's amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Lint the time detective, you are taking me back. Yeah. Uh, but that was uh, Saban uh, did a lot of work, and uh, those of us who were sort of the uh, the team. Yeah, we we came back and did a lot of things over and over again. But uh, if Flint, a time detective, was there, there was also um, ah, there was well, I'm, I just had a thought and it went away. But uh, there were several that uh, never even <laughs> made it out into yeah. general release, mm -hmm. and some of them were really quite good. Uh, one thing that I never, except for Julia, I never got to do much though. Were the uh, even though you see, I can do small voices. Mm -hmm. There are people. We always say this, I can do them. There are people who are them. And they sound like that all the time. And that they will always play the little um, leads, you know, the little four-year-olds that save the universe, those things. Yeah. Um, I don't usually get those, generally speaking. I mm -hmm. usually get, although um, Digimon, right? There was yeah, one oh, yeah. version of Digimon, and I don't remember which one it was. It was one of the later versions. I had played Birdramon, Garudamon, all that stuff. There mm -hmm. was one where they actually brought me in, and they had me there, and they said, hey, while you're here, why don't you just do Biomon? I said, why not? Let's get the whole sequence. Yeah, you yeah, you did Once. Biomon. I did Biomon one time. It's not yeah. my character. I didn't create it. But Digimon, they were handing those characters around like it was going out of style. A lot yeah. of people played a lot of things, you know? But uh, it was nice to have actually been able to play a little Beomon just one step one <laughs> and then turn into Birdramon, you know. Yeah. Speaking of Birdramon, how, how did you book an audition like that? I mean, like, come on, we're talking about Birdramon, right? a, red, a red bird, dragon bird, you know. Remember what we said about red hair? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Come on, I was a shoe in. <laughs> yeah, a Birdramon. Um, I don't, honest to God, I don't, re don't remember if I auditioned for that or if it was one of those things where they just knew I could do it. Yeah. That also happens. But Birdramon was easy. I showed up, I digivolved, I went home. You know, there wasn't <laughs> that much to say. But one time they said, uh, listen, we want you to, pl you're playing Birdramon, we like what you're doing. We want you to digivolve up and we want you to play Garudamon. Yeah. And I said, fine, what's a Garudamon? <laughs> and they showed me Garudamon and I went, um, that is, that is a boy. And then they, they kind of showed me the whole character and I went, wow, that, that's, that's, <laughs> yes. that's, that's not only a boy, that's freaking Jay Silverheels. I can't play <laughs> that. I mean, what? <laughs> so, and, Cause he, he, he's male as they come mm -hmm. big macho thing. And he talks like Tonto for crying out loud. Oh, I man. mean, and, and I said, you know, I hate to say this, guys, but this is really, okay, I'll try. And uh, I actually had to take a specific stance for him, like a samurai, you know, and yeah. kind of get into, the, get into the buns, as they say, and Ugh. I can't even do it now uh, without warming up. Right, but, yeah. But he was a big macho thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, if he had said, hmm, Kibosabi, I would have believed it. I mean, this, uh, he, he was so stereotypic, it was terrifying. But yeah. He was absolutely out of my wheelhouse because he is decidedly male. You see all the roles that I've played. A lot of them are yeah. questionable. Are they male? Are they female? What's going on here? And I, I get a lot of those androgynous things. Nothing yeah. androgynous about Garudamon. No, no. That's uh, a, Garudam that's Garudam a dude. Big boy. So he was a tough one. He actually, um, after I had a Grudemon session, I had to not book anything for the next day. Oh. There are some uh, that, that we call throat rippers. Yeah, for me, I cannot he, he believe was a that. Mm -hmm. Throat ripper. Another one, remember the um, Hercules and Xena series? Yes, yes, yes. I remember. Oh I my did, gosh, that's way better. A lot too. of voices for those. A lot of voices for those. And uh, a lot of the Amazons and Banshees and the shrieking whatnots that you hear. I was a lot of the females, uh, not all of them, but lots of us did it, but I was a good number of them. And they would bring us in for eight hour sessions. Yeah. It's doing fight and battle reactions for eight hours. Trust me, the next day, you're not even picking up the phone. Ooh. Blood it's, throat. And speaking of that, it's a good thing you bring that up because I remember um, there was another Digimon video game, Bob Buckles was directing. I think he had you come in to do Bergeron, Garudamon, and even Andrewamon. 
even though we know. Yeah. Here's a clip well, I, of it. If you don't I, mind covered An, I covered Angie Wimon. Remember I told you they bounced us around in Digimon? I did not create the voice for Angie yeah. Wimon. I th was that Edie Merman? Yeah, Edie Merman. Edie Merman, yeah. yep. And uh, at one point, my lady Devimon actually had a fight with Angie Wimon. Yeah, but, uh, I remember that. Which was fun. <laughs> hey, Goldilocks. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, he threw Angie Wimon. And there were other people who have played Bergeron, too. So... Mm -hmm. We got bounced around. It happened all the time. We kind of yeah. had to put up with it. Yeah, there's a fan posted this clip of you um, throwing your voice out um, as Bergamon, uh, Garudamon, and Andromon. It's like, it's, wow. I'm sorry. It's kind of like this. I'm sorry for this for right now. Yeah. And there's Garudamon. I am so sorry if my that is noisy. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I'm sorry. I know you said when you when I heard you did a fire hurricane, I kind of had to clench my throat because I can't imagine what you were going through when you were performing those voices. Because as Garudamon, as you mentioned before, it's a tough voice to carry. It is. It and honestly, I was surprised when they didn't process it a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I would have thought they would have processed it down and a little bit more. Uh, macho oh you know, yeah but they, they didn't they just took it as it's fine you know look those are not the decisions we make right right of course because they act they you just do what they, they're asking you to do and you know they like yeah, they like we're, it we're guns for hire mm -hmm. you know we, we go in there aim and shoot that's it and then after that it's up to them what they decide to do with it but uh yeah i, I and you woman you see it's a it's an odd thing with the way that they bounce the Digimon rolls around. Um, I don't like to lay claim mm -hmm. to any of the roles that I may have picked up later. Like, yes, I got to play Bioman, but Bioman is not my role. Yes, I got to play Angie Woman, but Angie Woman is not my right. role. I mean, there are people who don't have that particular scruple. I do. No, I understand. Um, yes, yeah, it's a, it's an actor's respect between the actors. I understand. Yeah, I filled in sure. for this actor. You know, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I can cover those if they want me to, but I don't lay claim to them. Right. And mm -hmm. if somebody comes over at a convention or whatever and says, "But you did the voice of Angie Woman," I would say, "I covered the voice of Angie Woman. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I I I I helped them out and I filled in for her." You know, I understudied, if you will, but right. I would I will not lay claim to somebody else's role. It mm -hmm. is not, I think, ethical. Yeah, and, and I completely understand that. Speaking of which, um, other versions of Digimon, you also play like different other roles like Togemon, the uh, cactus with the boxing glove. But well, Togemon, Togemon uh, was, I think, created by Mari Devon. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And yep. I think I picked up Togemon again. It was like the Anjuwamon thing. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, sometimes if a character only has a few lines and they're not yeah. bringing the other person in, they ask you to do what they call a voice match or a cover and you do your best you get as close as you can and hope yeah it, it's not too terrible yeah because that togemon role it was just a guest role i'm pretty sure mary elizabeth just called you in like to come in for this guest role and that was pretty much it and yeah, yeah speaking of happened. that role you also do a great job performing as crusader mon too because you you had that grace that style that cadence and in that character's voice, I can't tell. Like you say, you play roles where it's like you can't tell it's a boy or girl because. Well, that's what, Crusader Mon. I mean, Crusader Mon wears pink. Yeah. Kicks booty, <laughs> and you don't know particularly. I mean, in in some cases, uh, the same character is called Lord Nightmon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. N i g h t, which right that implies male, but mm -hmm. Crusader Mon can be anything. And right. if you look at the build of the character. For me, the build reads female. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And if you don't think that women can be uh, nasty warriors, just go into British history and look up a <laughs> oh, yeah. lovely lady named Queen Boudica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she scared the Romans, and scaring the <laughs> Romans is not easy. So, yeah, uh, it can happen. Um, but if you look at the character of Crusader Mon, I see a female build. Mm -hmm. That's my take on it. But you don't know. 
And it seemed to be for a while that if you had a character where it was like, you're not sure if it's a man, you're not sure if it's a woman, you don't know what the heck, call mm -hmm. Spivak, you know, they would bring yeah. me in. <laughs> and there is where my deeper tones worked. Mm -hmm. Because if I, when I really drop it down and it's basically in here, mm -hmm. that could be, that could be a guy. Yeah. Speaking of, I'm glad you just mentioned that because I want to go to that role of Kamatari from Rurouni Kenshin. Oh, it gets worse than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Were you just as surprised as I was when I found out that character was a guy? My gosh, it threw no. me. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> say they never tell me. Uh, first of all, uh, one of my favorite things in anime is the uh, juxtaposition of Samurai X and Rurouni Kenshin. Mm -hmm. you, have you seen both? Yes, yes, I have. Okay. Samurai X was done when anime was still what I call the Wild West. Mm -hmm. Nobody oh, yeah. was really all that worried about it being true and loyal to the original Japanese, which is why you end up in medieval Japan with the cops having Irish accents <laughs> in Samurai X, you know, which I thought was very funny. Yeah. But, same you know, here. When, when you start getting very loyal to the original subject matter, well, that's the sort of thing that goes out the window. I was in Samurai X as Misao. Mm -hmm. So it, with Misao, I was much lighter voiced. Oh, yes. Yeah. Misao is just one of these kind of characters. So I did Misao. And uh, then they said, well, we're redoing it as Varuna Kenshin. And they said, we are considering you for Kenshin. Because Kenshin also is a little mm -hmm. oh yeah hard to peg we'll put it that yeah, way yeah my friend chris knows all about that yeah uh, he, well he, it he... came down to me and richard cancino and of course cancino played it in samurai and yes, uh did. we're we're we've been friends for a million years <laughs> and we were, we were cracking up about this whole thing and he scored kenshin he got his role back he, he should did. have gotten his role back. He deserved he the role Oh, back. yes, he did. Man. Considering me was just an interesting, weird twist on things. Mm -hmm. But now they had this slightly used understudy for Kenshin, me. <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, how's Kamatari? Oh, Kamatari is perfect. We'll give her Kamatari. So they put me in as Kamatari. And that's how that happened. You know, because I, they had somebody who they knew could play a gender ambiguous yeah and you got commentary well you don't get more gender ambiguous than commentary yeah come to, yeah <laughs> so i came right in as that and there you go i mean it could have been played any number of ways they decided to go with a deep voiced female and i'm down with that works for me you, do, you because, always do it you always yeah. do an awesome job at that it, always melody uh, and i'm and i'm really being honest it's my it's, i'm entitled to my opinion but i'm just saying every time i hear your voice in any anime series i'm like yep that's why i'm not they, cho they chose right the, the, the casting directors chose right they got her in she always give it her all no matter what road they got her in she's doing a great job thank you again well you can keep talking for the next <laughs> hour and a half i'm okay with this <laughs> speaking of which um i know it's another guest role like around the same time um Cow cowboy bebop vt Whew, now that was a more create a role for you because you gave out a more southern tough girl accent well, like bouncer type character you know like she's a trucker she's trucker. A trucker there we go trucker that's it trucker heavy metal queen yes yes uh yeah and vt uh again it, it, there's a little gender ambiguity there but you're mm -hmm. pretty clear that this is a female she's just a female on steroids you know? <laughs> yeah um and she likes cats and i like cats and everything is good uh, yeah. zeros good old zeros <laughs> uh, but vt has had the most astonishing history she was a one-off first i per mm -hmm. thought she was going to come back i, I so thought too. she was going to come back to because that there's a character that is interesting it parallels the lead very they're they're very similar characters very um, very and there was a respect between them mm -hmm. that I found intriguing. There was a lot about her that was intriguing. Well, I thought so. What I didn't realize is that the fans were going to think so. All these years later, when I go to a convention or whatever, VT is one of the characters that is constantly brought up. She's the one of the ones that people remember. They really remember her. And she, um, I, I related to her. 
on her own, woman in a man's world. This tied in for me particularly because um, of my history in theatrical sword fighting. Mm -hmm. I've had to train many six foot macho, Ooh. stupid people. <laughs> No, when you walk in Fine. and you're a five foot five female, they look yeah. at you like, what the heck are you going to know? And then you have to show them without making an attitude problem out of it, without going in and, and being all, you know, be, yeah. I had to be like VT. Mm -hmm. I had to go in there and say, it's not about male or female. It's not about size. It's not about age. It's not about any of that stuff. What it's about is we have a project to do. Let's do it. And VT is the same kind of gal. Mm -hmm. She's got a, she's, got some a job that needs doing she gets it done she did mm -hmm. and then she messes with people on the side <laughs> makes yeah. her money out of what you know what's my name yep. she has to earn her respect the same way a man would in a man's world and i know that from the stage combat yeah Whew. and you do and explain a little bit more of the stage combat because you did some sword training so like if i come at you with another sword i'm afraid you might put me on my rear badly i might so <laughs> but you're a martial artist so i might not and besides yeah. you should have hit me a few years ago uh yeah. it started with my background in uh classical theater and shakespearean theater you do learn a certain amount of sword fighting and stage combat in that actually my first stage combat role was while i was still in in uh, college and we mm. were doing cabaret and there was a bar brawl and I had to get thrown around and do some fighting and whatever. Uh, I played a Kit Kat girl named Texas. And she was a tough gal. Uh, she was a very tough gal. Don't mess with Texas. And uh, she taught me, or I learned there a little bit. And then I learned more with my Shakespeare and classical theater. And then when I first got to New York, I got a job at a Renaissance fair, of all things, playing Maid Marian. I told you, checkered career. Yeah. And a lot of we got I learned a lot from the people who were sword fighting in the course of that fair. Then I moved out to California and I, I studied well in New York. I studied with a couple of Olympian fencers. And then I moved out to California and met a man named Ralph Faulkner. You don't know him. Look him up. Okay. This is the man. He was an Olympian. He was also an actor and he did a lot of the classical films like prisoner of zenda the old black and white films you know like with cornell wilde and 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 oh, wow. errol flynn and all those but anytime you see them with their back to the camera it's it was ralph faulkner doing the fighting and he was that good and he was an actor well by the time i met him he was quite old yeah i'm looking at i'm looking at his birthday right now he passed away in 87 yeah he yeah. Oh. And, and I, we, all of us who studied with him adored him. We would have, uh, we would have defended him to the death. He was a classic gentleman of the old school, elegant, magnificent. He was wow. still in love with his wife who died in the 1940s or 50s. You know, he was a romantic. Wow. He was something from another age. And at that point, he couldn't really lunge or do the legwork too much but his hands, and he wore Coke bottle bottom glasses, really thick, but his hands were so fast that he could still beat the 18-year-olds at, at fine work, at, at foil work. And, and I studied with him and I would never have traded that time for anything. So I was studying and I was studying also with some stunt coordinators who also had backgrounds in sword fighting. Well, it built and mm -hmm. we got to know people and I was doing Shakespeare and what have you. I did the world's first sword and sorcery Coriolanus don't ask I was wearing chain mail a lot yeah, you're fine <laughs> but um I ended up working at Universal Studios tour in the live action Conan the Barbarian stunt show as Red Sonia world's shortest Red Sonia at 5'5 five five. she's supposed <laughs> to be 5'11 I would have looked like one of her legs but uh that was where the sword fighting really got consolidated where I met a number of stunt coordinators and from that show i was brought in to do my first real stunt job which was not a sword fighting job i just had to fall down and that was on a series called scarecrow and mrs king man that that, that story about ralph faulkner now i can't thank you enough for sharing that because 
I'm always intrigued of seeing somebody that's much older that have like experience like that man has and still, you know, can knock 18 year olds down on their rear like it's like it's nothing, you know. And he was in his 90s at the time. Oh, even more yes. amazing. My goodness. It's an astonishing man. And um, there was, you know, who Doug- Douglas Fairbanks was? I do not, fortunately. Classic film actor, swashbuckler of the old school. We're talking the 30s and that whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, grief, it's almost 100 years ago. I'm getting yeah. terrified here. But <laughs> they had at, in, in a theater in Beverly Hills, they had a, um, a Douglas Fairbanks Jr. retrospective. And they were doing a bunch of his films, very high-end thing, people coming in all glitzed out, red carpet, the whole deal. Ralph Faulkner showed up. It, and he, had a, he looked like a Galapagos tortoise at this point. He had 90-some, I mean, he just yeah. old, old, old dude. Looked like he escaped from a pyramid, but <laughs> elegant. And he, he was wearing this beautiful old-style suit and had a sash, you know, like Dracula's sash. <laughs> he was wearing his Olympic medals. Classy. And he walked over to me with this ramrod straight posture. He walked over to me in the lobby. He put out his arm and he said, would you do me the honor of being my lady for the evening? Oh. And I put my, because uh, well, we were working together, and I put my hand, I was never so honored in my life. And when we walked into the theater, we got a standing ovation because oh. they knew who he was. And the respect was bone deep. And I was, I have never in my life been as honored to be seen with any human being ever, ever. I mean, how could, he's a legend, the legend, and they knew who he was. This was the golden age of Hollywood. He was like one of the last people standing from the golden age of Hollywood. And I asked him once, what's it like to be as old as you are and having outlived all of your friends he said oh it's no big deal outliving my friends it's it's outliving their grandchildren that has me freaked out (laughs) (laughs) and uh, at one point his studio was in hollywood in an area that was getting a little funky Mm -hmm. and somebody broke in and stole his olympic sword and he that those people were chased down the street by a bunch of 18 year olds and 20 somethings wielding blades who would cheerfully have destroyed that human being i I think the cops finally got it back but it was just you did we called him the boss you did not mess with the boss you messed with the boss and you had every sword fighter in hollywood out for your blood we Mm. loved that man we loved that man got a great legacy and i'm glad you shared that story ralph ralph Faulkner. i'm definitely gonna look up him more after this interview because i never it's rare to hear somebody that for someone to be that decent of a person living as long as he's did oh yes it's was a, always amazing a know. gentleman of the antique school yeah and and ramrod post i mean he's 90 some years old and you could have just put a stick down his spine perfect posture elegant and the way he got into sword fighting he was doing a film in the 1920s and they had to do log rolling you know what log rolling is where the the, 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 the lumberjacks well he'd been raised in the pacific northwest with the big logs and they were using small logs so they were going faster his leg went through the logs the log jam closed crushed his leg when he came out of rehab they said uh okay you're gonna have to do some exercise he said what can i do and they said, well, you can do fencing because it doesn't involve twisting. It's straight. It's, you know, forward and back, which he got into. And he ended up winning an Olympic medal. Well, come and, back. And then came back into films and started teaching everybody how it's done. Man. And well, that's, come- uh, oh, the, the man was amazing. The man was amazing. The more you learn about him, like the it's- prisoner of Zenda, some of the beautiful things that he did man in the iron mask it, 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 it he is a legend of the golden age he's a legend of the old school they don't make him like that anymore uh, yeah i honestly <laughs> agree with you with that i honestly agree man thank this you was for a, sharing this that was a, a true gentleman and i was privileged to have known him mm-hmm. yeah. whenever yeah. i do sword fighting <laughs> now i kind of dedicate it to him in my head I highly respect that. It's hard for me to go jump to the next question now because you just shared. I was not expecting the story, and I'm, I'm, 
I'm honored and privileged that you shared the story with me, Melody, because there's always going to be someone that always that decent and such a down to earth person. Like, thank you, Melody. <laughs> and everyone says that everybody in Hollywood is a bad person. Well, there are plenty everywhere. And, mm -hmm. you know, the industry tends to attract a certain flavor of yeah. weird. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, there's a diamond. Oh, yeah. And this man was a true, flawless diamond. When I found out that he was still in love with his wife 50 years after she died, or 40 years or whatever it was after she, I always used to joke with him, if only I'd met you 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I he respect looked, that. <laughs> look at the pictures of him in his 30s. He was a hot looking dude. I mean, in an elegant kind of old school way. He was, oh, yeah, I respect that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a, yeah, Ralph Faulkner. Definitely, I'm de you definitely. I'm more enticed to research him more after this interview. So oh I want to. Uh, just he just go, came up on the screen. He was born in 1891. I keep forgetting. Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes! Yikes! Yeah. yeah I, I knew him in the 80s. So, yeah. Yeah, I want to move uh, a lot forward. Um, sure. Go ahead. Like around 20, either 2016 or 2017. You got a call from somebody from like Studioopolis to come back to voice Bergemon for the uh, one of the Digimon Tri movies. So what was your reaction to coming back as Bergemon after all this time has passed? In your oh, lifetime? I loved it. I loved it. Uh, I, you know, Bergemon, I have a soft spot for Bergemon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can you not? She too had a certain nobility to her. I mean, I mm -hmm. joke about, I would just show up, scream, Digivolve oh, and yeah. go home. But there was an honor to Bird Ramon as well. And I, I, I like that. But um, the Digivolve, you know, Digivolve to Bird Ramon, she had a certain impact, uh, you know, a certain, uh, what, what is the word? Gravi not gravitas. Cadence. Power. Power. Yeah, yeah power, she yeah. had power. And she represented good. And, and her, uh, you know, I've, I've always loved astronomy. So how can you argue with meteor wing? <laughs> yeah, like you shall. Yeah, you shall. They they allowed you to say like a couple of times in that in that one session you did, and you. It was my attack. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 you did the the squawking and the yelling like when Bergamo was infected by the virus. You you screech. <laughs> yeah, I mean I will play it, but I'll. I'll <laughs> it, it it was amazing because you you were giving it your all because they I'm pretty sure the director Ryan Johnson told you like okay Bergamo is affected by this virus you got to feel like you're a rabbit beast or something like that yes 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 it's, yeah well shows anybody can go bad under the right pressure <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah and you and you took advantage of of that so far because i remember like i just like let me find this clip there is one scene where um sora was calling out to you and then you was trying it, it was a lot going on let me find it there always is yeah it's right here You, yeah, yeah we, the we death scream? scenes are always interesting. Uh, you know, you get it in anime, but where you really get it is in the games. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are always death screams and whatnot. And uh, I always loved when I was a kid coming up watching science fiction like Rodan, the, the pterodactyl screaming <laughs> and, and the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, that beautiful, beautiful death cry from those. Uh, those are always they yeah. should rip your heart out. Mm -hmm. They should rip your heart out. Mm -hmm. uh, you're sometimes you're scared of these creatures. You're impressed by these creatures. You don't want to get in the way of these creatures, whatever right, it is. Right. But then you see them vulnerable and in distress, and it should get right into your soul and tear your heart out if it's done right. And I try. I do you, try you did a great it. job with Bergamon when she was infecting. Like she's trying to fight the urge of becoming a, a rabid beast. You know, attacking. Her fellow partner Digimon. Yeah. It it was a lot going on that scene, as you can tell when you were recording. So, well, it's always tragic when you see a hero impaired or a hero dying mm -hmm. or a hero um, that goes dark and and dangerous, and you realize that all that power that was always on your side now you may have to kill them, or stop them, or injure them, 
for the sake of everybody and you don't want to do that. This was your ally. So it's a very complicated, it sounds weird when you're just laying there like a, a big bird screaming, but yeah, it's emotionally complicated. And here we get back to you're an actor and you're not doing voices. You, why is this character making that sound? What is behind it? How much pain is there? How much nobility is left? How much is it the character fighting against it? You know, and all that will change how you uh, approach the sound. Mm -hmm. Context is very, very important in oh, the story. I'm glad you brought up the C word, context. <laughs> um, for those people who are gamers and are watching a lot of the characters that we play in games, I would love you to realize that generally speaking, we never get context. Our lines are pulled out of the script and given to us cold. Cold read, not, yeah. Have, oh, oh, well, it's not just a cold read. A cold read, you often know what you're reacting to. Okay. We don't know what oh, okay. we're reacting to. Now, one of the uh, exercises that I like to do when I do classes is uh, the what is that exercise. The only line you have is what is that? But you don't know what you're reacting to. Did you just hear something in a haunted house do you are you looking at a beautifully wrapped present and you think it's exactly what you were hoping for did you just step in something some dog owner should have cleaned up what when you say what is that you need to know what are you reacting to context and when it often um oh yeah i remember we did one uh we, we were uh, casting directing uh some of the Star Trek games, and yeah. they broke the dialogue out, not only uh, out of context, but alphabetically. Mm. The lines were done so you don't even know what order they come in. You don't know if you're angry. You don't know if you're happy. You don't know if you're scared. You don't know what's going on. Okay, the director helps. The director helps. But quite often, if our reactions in games don't sound like they make sense relative to what you just heard another character say it's because we never heard the other character say it yeah and we don't know and many times the directors even are not familiar with the entire project they're often learning as they go and they're they're not always able to help you so <laughs> that's yeah. my little excuse for if you hear something weird yeah thank you for sharing that because i heard the, the expression cold read when it comes to anime dubbing but with cold something like that for video games where you just they tell you to react to this and just react. Now that's a well, tough skill to do. Dubbing is always a cold read. Dubbing is yeah. always a cold mm -hmm. read. You, you never get, well, here we go. Again the, ahead of time. the never word. Mm -hmm. Mostly 99.999. You don't see the script before you show up in the studio. You don't. Mm -hmm. So it's always a cold read. But if you can see context and you see what you're reacting to, you at least have a leg to stand up. If your lines yeah. are broken up alphabetically and you don't know what you're reacting to, then, you know, as an actor, go ahead and do that. What is that exercise? You know, what is yeah. that? Are you in a haunted house? Are you here? Are you there? Yeah. Or are you frightened? Are you sick? Or did yeah. you just look down and see that you grew a, a seventh toe? You know, what are you reacting to? If you don't know, it makes it very difficult to give a proper reaction. Mm -hmm. And in games, it happens all the time. Yeah. But yeah, but another show that you did, but it's a prelay show. It's called OK KO. Let's be here. You play a character called Foxtail now. <laughs> well, Foxtail, you know, Foxtail's kind of a tough girl, and uh, she's she's a wrestler and she's in charge of these uh, <laughs> superheroes, you know. And uh, this is the thing about Foxtail. <laughs> oh boy, am I in trouble? If the wrong person hears this. Uh, I had a next door neighbor years and years ago who was a casting director who was. Um, five foot nothing little fire plug from Atlanta and I based Foxtail on her. Mm -hmm. I pay, totally based Foxtail on her. And uh, she and I were doing the Atlanta Marathon one year. I'm not going to say your name if you're listening. You know who you are. <laughs> and uh, she'd forgotten that the day before the Atlanta Marathon that she had a wedding to go to the night before in Atlanta. I'm sorry, the LA Marathon. So she did that wedding, got relaxed, <laughs> flew home on the red eye got a half an hour sleep and then got dragged off to do the la marathon she'd never done a marathon in her life 
she had trained, but she hadn't done the marathon. Well, she finished the marathon. And when I found her, she was wrapped in one of those silver blankets. And she looked up at me and she said, that was the worst thing I ever did in my life. I will not do another. <laughs> and, I, and I said, that's foxtail. <laughs> that's foxtail that's foxtail so uh yeah that's foxtail that's you where, had that's where she came from <laughs> yeah she she sounded like you had a, a blast performing performing that character like she she was doing a lot in the in the scenes that they got her doing like i seen her flying with her tail oh yeah <laughs> well they don't like, call her foxtail for nothing yeah she's a, she's definitely a character for sure and then you and that voice that voice cadence you gave to her you you capture it so well, and I'm glad that they never used nobody else for that character. They just, it was a perfect, perfectly cast. They cast you as well, Foxtail, and I can't they think. Were sc- they were scared of me. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> that I can believe. I can believe for sure. Actually, OKKO was uh, a different form of voice acting for people who are keeping track of the different kinds of voice acting there yeah. are. OKKO was not dubbing. OKKO was what they call original animation. Mm-hmm. And the difference with that is that it hasn't been animated yet. I mean, very often you'll have storyboards or some rough animation to work off of. But in uh, original animation, you have everybody who is in the scene in the room with you. And it's done almost like radio theater. Everyone is standing at their little easel and they have their script and they do their bit. Mm -hmm. But the difference is you are hearing the other characters you are able to work off of the other characters because the other actors are in the room with you. And it has a more theatrical quality because you're not alone in a dark room doing it. You have the rest of the cast there Mm -hmm. with you. And that makes a difference in how you approach things. It certainly makes a difference in, I think, the dynamic and the energy level. Exactly. I Mm -hmm. really, I enjoy original animation. I truly do. Uh, I like them both but they're different. We've had things in uh, anime and what have you, and and sometimes in films where we're doing looping or dubbing, and people say, oh, you did this scene with thus and such, and it might have been an intense love scene for all of that. How was it working with this person or that person? And you have to really work to get people's heads around the idea that you never met them. Yeah, or met... You never even saw them. You have never dealt with each other. In anime, it's almost an advantage to be one of the last people they bring in because sometimes they can play you the other performances and yeah. you can react to them. Mm-hmm. If you're doing it yourself for the first time, if you're the first character, you're yeah, the first in, actor, yeah. You're just throwing it out there and hoping it sticks against the wall. You know, you go with what the director tells you and you do the best Mm -hmm. you can with what you got, but you do not meet the other actors. You do not hear the other actors and you have no idea what their performance is going to be if you're the first one in. Yeah, it's always a challenge. A bit later and they can play things for you and you can kind of work off the other actors. But uh, it it, you're you're put in some very interesting positions and sometimes you just have to create it out of your own mind. This is another reason why people want to become voice actors aside from first be an actor, take theater classes, do theater, learn all that stuff. The other thing is take improv. You are going to need it, especially if you're doing things like looping on a Mm -hmm. film where you have, uh, you know, they'll literally have a bunch of you in the room and they'll have a scene come up and they'll say, okay, there's a woman walking a dog and then there's somebody else at the restaurant and then there's a person driving by and then the and you are just told which one you are. So you watch them in the background and you have to completely create their reality. Whatever they're talking about, you have to come up with it on the fly. It's right. not scripted. You have to improv that on the fly. And you had best be able to do it because yeah. if you cannot do it, there's a line of 50 to 100 people right behind you who can, who are glad to take the job. Yeah, that's why I always think about the word improv. I always think about creativity and imagination when it comes to improv because as an actor, that's good. That got to be your bread and butter. You got to come up with your own scenario, how you react to it as quickly and sufficient as possible when you're performing. No matter what. Whatever the circumstance. (laughs) I mean, it can even happen in theater. Uh, There have been any number of times when I've been doing live theater 
where for some reason you are in a scene, you have finished the scene, mm -hmm. you have finished the line, and character X is supposed to come in from stage left and no character X and they don't show up. You know, for whatever reason, they're stuck backstage, they, they missed the cue, they don't. Well, now you're out there in front of the audience with egg on your face and you'd better <laughs> be able to pull it out of the north wind. You are going to have to improv as the character to fill the time until that other person shows up and you don't know why they're late. You don't know how long it's going to be. Now that's an art form. Yeah. I was in uh, a show, uh, was, uh, The Seagull, I think. Uh, very Russian, tragic, very intense. Uh, you know, all these Russians running around talking about how dismal life is, you know, that one of those. And a character missed the cue. The person playing my husband missed the cue. I was in the wings. He wasn't. We could, I couldn't go on without him. And I'm sitting there, wait, well, the character that was on stage in the chair launched into a monologue about his childhood in Kiev that was so fascinating that when the character, other character did show up and we were ready to make our entrance, we decided not to. We wanted to hear what happened. Mm -hmm. We just let this other guy go. We got a little <laughs> ad libs and, and improv. It was brilliant. I mean, but if the person had not been that good, we would have been in deep trouble. So improv is another thing. If you yeah. want to be an actor, if you want to be a voice actor, if you learn theater, do theater, yeah. learn improv. Oh, for pity's sake, learn improv. <laughs> if you do nothing else, learn improv. And if you're going to do things like video games, I would strongly suggest that you take either martial arts like you did or mm -hmm. stage combat. One of the things I was known for for a long time, they called me stunt voice because most women don't know what it sounds like to be wounded or to give a hit, take a hit, fall down. They don't know what it sounds like. And it sounds very different depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to know the difference. I have not only been in stage combat and done other, I've had some phenomenal injuries, uh, at least coming out of my horse work and things like that. I've also, I grew up around the medical field and spent some time in hospitals. I've been in emergency rooms. The, sound, the sounds that people make when they're critically injured are not what you think they are. It sounds weird, but go to hospitals. Try to listen to the sounds unfortunate people make because you're going to be called upon to do that. Go to a martial arts class, even if you don't want to get beat up yourself. Stand there and listen to what it sounds like when somebody takes a hit to the gut and falls down and they're not prepared. You know how that sounds. Oh, yeah. It doesn't sound like, ah, no, no it does not. <laughs> so uh you know learn all of that this is my advice to young actors part this is the part which is like okay you really want to do this this is what you need to know know all of that know human reactions pay attention to people in different circumstances and incorporate that into your soul into your reality into who you are so that when you go to the cabinet and open it up, you expect to find a can of hash. It better be a can of hash. You have put it there because one time you heard somebody make an interesting sound under the well, suddenly now you have to do it. You got to pull it out. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a long process. It's not doing voices. Yeah, it's not. Oh, exactly. And speaking of um, your voiceover career, when the pandemic first hit, did it affect you in a very strong way like it did for many other actors trying to adjust to oh, having like yes, a home studio? Uh, yeah, because home studios were coming up anyway, and people yeah. were doing things like having uh, little laptop studios that they would take when they go on trips or go to cons or go to visit, you know, Aunt Sadie in Massachusetts or whatever, so that they could do auditions. Auditions, yep. Mm -hmm. That was happening and home studios were happening, but they were not happening to the extent that they are happening now because everyone's figured out that you don't have to go into the studio yeah. to do this. And if you have a good home setup, you can do almost anything. I have a very good friend who does audiobooks, and that is her. That is what she does. And she does them at home. And, you know, there are people who are doing them like sitting at the kitchen table. No, nah, come on, guys. 
wake up and smell the coffee. You can make a home studio relatively easily. You need the electronics, I'll grant you, but you don't need a sound booth. You just hang some um, furniture pads, literally, around and create your own booth. You can do Revise. that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not that hard, but you just have to think a little bit. Just mute the sounds, get the right electronics, and that is the way of the future. <laughs> that is definitely the way of the future. When COVID was happening, the last thing you wanted to do was go into a studio where everyone's been breathing. Mm -hmm. mm. And I'm sorry, but you can't do this job with a mask. Nope. So what's the, what's the answer? Home studio. Uh, I'm, we're still doing it, uh, and a lot of us are still doing it. Uh, we've got sessions coming up for video games that I can't talk about. <laughs> oh, no worry. Uh, I would not dare to ask that because I understand Welcome that to NDA. the wonderful world of the NDA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Non-disclosure agreement, but I will say that I am working on several uh, projects and characters that will be coming out, and that's all I can say about it. But no um, worries. I'm doing them at the home studio. Great. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Because that's what COVID has done to us. Mm -hmm. COVID has really forced the issue. This would have been happening anyway, but COVID compressed it and made it faster. And that's the effect that COVID has had. And oh, yeah, by the way, a lot of work did just go by the wayside. A lot of uh, on-camera work. So whole projects died because people didn't want to go down to a set and breathe on everybody else or be breathed on. Yeah. So the whole industry took a heck of a hit. But it's coming back. It's coming back. And little by little, um, people are feeling more comfortable about going to a set, people trying to take a certain amount of precaution, you know, and uh, understandable. Maybe they're not doing kissing scenes as much or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, you can write around a lot of it but when it was at its worst oh no it was very hard and yeah. a lot of a lot of income didn't come in for a lot of actors <laughs> <laughs> because of that <laughs> so i guess we've come kind of to um the end of our little journey through yes, my life yes we, we yeah we did <laughs> and i and i cannot thank you enough melody for your time you share so much that I did not expect to be hearing, and I'm very, very honored for your time. Thank you so much. That. Come on, there isn't an actor on the planet that can't talk about themselves for an hour and a half. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> We're notorious for it. Always, yeah. And you, and I have to say, you're the one of the most humble actors I'm mm. ever to engage with because you know a lot about how the business operates and the gen your wisdom knows no bounds melody and oh, i can't thank, thank you, you again for sharing your time with me and best of luck with the remainder of your career and i know it's going to still strive as strong as ever oh absolutely i don't i intend to um, as they say in the horse world die in harness i don't see any point i mean let's say that the the stunt work probably is gonna have to, <laughs> i can understand, uh, yeah. lighten up a little bit although yeah. the, the live act the show that i just did i was teaching 18 year olds how to sword fight again so i guess that aspect of my life is not over but um voice work unless something happens to your Vo your, your throat or your vocal cords yeah you, you can do it forever and i intend to no. i intend to do it to the day i die for several weeks thereafter <laughs> <laughs> and i'm praying for it for sure and because i want to hear, hear you again in the next 20 years or so you know <laughs> works for me i'm perfectly okay with that well thank right. you for visiting with me you're welcome. And thank you for your time again. And you take care of yourself, Melody, and you have 